Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, welcome to our final session on the Melchizedek Priesthood. Now we know uh, that Melchizedek, uh, the priest in the Old Testament, he was the one who brought forth um, the bread and the wine for Abraham and uh, originally no one knows his origin but in the book of um, Hebrews it tells that us that he's without father, without mother. So that really tells us a clue, angelic. And uh, no beginning, no ending. He just appeared and disappeared. So we know that he was a cherub who serves um, with uh, Adam like as a guardian angel. And uh, when Adam passed away, uh, 930 years old, Marquis the cherub asked permission from God to continue for a little bit the uh, priesthood ministry and he did that successfully all the way until he imparted everything to Abraham and then he went forth and completed his work and the rest is up to us mankind here and then when Jesus Christ rose from the dead he took on the Melchizedek priesthood and he is a high priest we have touched on several points on um, here are the main five points to give today's point that in a Melchizedek priesthood, uh, there are certain things that we need to grow into and as goals and aims in our life. It requires that we know God and that we help others to know God. The Melchizedek priesthood is a priesthood to bring us to perfection. So we must be perfect in Christ and impart perfection, uh, impart the perfection of Christ. Thirdly, Melchizedek priesthood is uh, to partake of the nature or DNA of Christ and to administrate the substance of this DNA unto others. And it can be done in various methods. And in number four, it's a new covenant, new dimension, new level of praise and worship. We talk about the establishment of praise and worship uh, in which praise and worship becomes more effective, more powerful under the Melchizedek priesthood. Finally, today we're going to look at a heavenly priesthood establishing better promises. In the Bible, it tells us here that um, uh, in chapter 8 of Hebrews, it talks about a better covenant. And that's in line with what we call the new priestly ministry. So let's consider this as a closing series to the Melchizedek priesthood. It says in chapter 8 of Hebrews, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. So you say many, many things. You say these are the main points. Jesus being a high priest. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected are not man. This Melchizedek priesthood actually serves with God in heaven. It's not... Uh, anything on the earth. Everything is the real and the true priesthood that serves God's throne right now is the Melchizedek priesthood. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also has something to offer. So the Melchizedek priesthood has something to offer because every priest offers and brings forth gifts and sacrifices of which people come, they are blessed, they are comforted, uh, their prayers are answered before God and everything. So this priesthood of Melchizedek has something to offer. What is it? We're going to read on. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Since they are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, immediately it tells us the Melchizedek priesthood is a heavenly priesthood. And that's <coughs> part of point five. The Melchizedek priesthood is a heavenly priesthood. None of these are but of the heavens above. Now that, what does that require of us? Jesus makes us kings and priests. But under this, understanding this point, it means that for us, to function like Jesus in the heavenly uh, priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood, we ourselves must be familiar in heaven. We must know the heavens above. We must live at the a, at a throne room of God in order to be an effective priesthood of Melchizedek. Let's read on. 
For if, in verse 4, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Again, emphasizing heavenly, everything on the earth is a copy and shadow. Even Moses, he says, as Moses was divinely instructed, when he was about to make the tabernacle, he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on a mountain. The earth copy of uh, Tabernacle of Moses, which was, I mean, to us on the earth, glorious, filled with the glory of God, wonderful, took them a year to build it. And uh, later on, these pieces were transferred into the temple. And there's only one main ark built. There's no other ark built. There's only one main ark. And the same ark went into the temple. Later on, when the first temple was destroyed, it's hidden by Jeremiah. The second temple did not contain the ark. And um, so, all these things that were glorious on the earth were actually just copies, duplicates, tiny little um, duplication of some of the pattern of thing in heaven. So you can imagine now in the Melchizedek priesthood, we actually serve in the heavenly land. We serve in the true temple of God in heavens above. Verse 6, But now, he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Now what does he mean by better covenant, better promises, everything is better, everything is new? Why is it that many people are looking at a better covenant, better promises? We still look at the old promises. Do you know? Do you know that in the old covenant it includes healing, include prosperity, it includes success? Because in uh, Joshua chapter one verse eight, uh, Joshua was told, "If you uh, do not depart from the, this law of the Lord and meditate it day and night, that you will make your way successful." So all those things. Now, if in a new covenant, we still have these things. Of course, we have everything of the old. If we have all these things, what is better? What is the difference? There's a lot. In healing, in the old covenant, it is uh, it's like a request kind of, kind of thing. You got to pray for healing. In the new, it is just announced and pronounced over your life. In the old each occasion needs a sacrifice. In the new, there's one sacrifice done and your victory is assured. It's all done in Christ. All you have to do is receive the portion that Jesus enables your faith to have. So in the Old Testament, they got all these things that, you know, people go continue. Sometimes people continue in you like the old, except that they didn't have the animal sacrifice. They make their request to God, they work, and all these things, and, and, and make all these things, that continual request in God. They forgot that everything has changed in the new. In the new, it has already been given. So how does that operate? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, He creates in us, through His DNA, the portion of faith to receive. That which is all already given in Christ. So definitely methodology is different. And definitely the uh, promises that he has given are far better. You can ask for far better things in God. You can advance more in the spiritual things. And many of the realms of the spiritual are just open to us for us to hunger and thirst after. Says in verse 7, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for second. So obviously the first is insufficient. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, where I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that he makes to the house of Israel in these last days. I will put my laws in their mind, write them on their hearts. 
I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to the unrighteousness and the sins and the lawlessness I will remember no more. Hmm. This ministry of Melchizedek high priest is heavenly. It's all administered from heaven above. And it's the very throne and place for God. Firstly, what does it mean to be seated in the heavenly places today? Today's high priest is right up there, seated in heavenly place with Christ. As it's mentioned here in uh, the beginning, in chapter 8, verse 1, we have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. That's a high priest right up there. Uh, anything they request goes right into God's ears and God's heart. Seated at the right hand of God. It's a position of authority and power. Ephesians, when they talk about the victory of Jesus over sin, our position in Christ in Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at these uh, things that are going on on the earth. From verse 1 to verse um, 3, it talks about the work of Satan upon the uh, minds of people who are the children of wrath. Uh, verse 4 contrasts in Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ, in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is what God wants to do. Having saved us in Christ, he's seated at the right hand and he wants to show the greatness of his mercy and his supreme power over the earth. This sitting position Again, it's mentioned, let's look at it in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says here that uh, last enemy to be destroyed and here he comes uh, here in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For it is in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule, all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The sitting position of Jesus on the throne indicates that he has, not will, not will be, but he has overcome all the works of the enemy. There is a difference between, for example, uh, every time you need something, uh, let's say um, the person who, who is in charge over your life gives you a check. Then you need uh, grocery. Here's a check for grocery. Uh, and then you need a um, um, uh, car. Here's a check for the car. You need uh, clothes. Here's a check for it. Uh, each time there's a different transaction, but not in a new covenant. In the new covenant, all authority and power has already been won in Christ. Didn't the Bible declare that uh, in Philippians 2, when God proclaimed that the name, let all worship the name of Jesus, let the name of Jesus Christ be the name above every authority and power and principality, and let all bow to that name and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
in that sense, in that sense, all authority and power has already been given. And uh, so once it's been given and is delegated, there is a difference in the way we come against Satan. Nevermore do you ask God to chase the devil for you. Because that authority has been given to you as a king and priest in Christ Jesus. You would have to exercise your authority against the devil. Of course, you can ask God to reveal to you so that you will know all the knowledge that is necessary in order to take your authority. It's just a matter of knowing, not a matter of uh, receiving. It's already been given. All authority and power has been given in our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament, you are the one who have authority to cast out devils. In my name they shall cast out devils, in Mark 16. You are the one with authority to chase the enemy away. God will not come down from heaven and chase the devil away for you. Although the presence of the angels and all that through your prayer will build a barrier and a surrounding, a shield about you so that the enemy cannot come near. But in terms of you going forth to take authority to expand the kingdom of God as a king and priest in God, remember Melchizedek was a priest and he was a king, king of Salem, we have to exercise our authority going forth. Not asking God to do. You as a priest have been delegated, delegated authority. In other words, victory has already been given. It is like one check has been given. And all you need to do is just uh, take, come and take the portion that God has delegated unto each one of us. Now the question is, how do we take that portion? How do we achieve and receive that portion, which is this part here, in the same Bible. After he talked, you notice that after he talked about uh, Jesus' authority, new covenant, and uh, we are actually in the book of uh, Hebrews. Hebrews. Can you see his consistency after he presented the new, uh, new and better covenant? In chapter 8, chapter 9, he gives some illustration of the early services that were present compared to the heavenly services of the high priest in verse 11. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. See, good things to come. All the goodness of God, all the mercy of God that was not possible now become possible and the good things to come that stand not with the blood of goats and cows but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once and for all having obtained redemption. And so he talks about this completion of Christ's work and then he moves on to chapter 10 again saying that Christ in his death and resurrection perfects everything. Uh, here is chapter 10. In verse 11, Every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice which can, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down again at the right hand of God. A position of authority, a position of power to administrate. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Who is going to make the enemies his footstool? All those delegated with the priesthood ministry of Melchizedek is to exercise the authority. For by one offering is perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And then after uh, mentioning that, he says, we enter with a true heart. And we draw near with a full assurance of faith and we, we hold fast to the confession of our hope and 
then he talks about this uh, not drawing back but pushing forward in chapter 11 this faith is a substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not said this substance of faith that is administered by the priesthood ministry and based on this quantity of faith that God gives we are able to do all kinds of things everything is by faith he says by faith all the Old Testament folks that operated by faith this, by faith that and everything by faith then he ends with verse 39 similar pattern and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise he did not manifest to them God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us what's the difference in taking authority in the Old Testament New Testament in the New Testament we exercise the name of Jesus authority in the New Testament, you exercise authority, use the name of Jesus, command healing to flow forth. In the New Testament, you speak to the mountain, because everything is subject to the name of Jesus. The only requirement is that your nature must be equal and in line with the nature of Jesus in carrying out your work. Your inner man must be in line with the inner man of Jesus in carrying out his work. Then you just speak the name of Jesus, proclaim the name of Jesus, and it is all done. So after it's all done, what else? What else is there to do? Two things. To continue the exercise of faith. See, you don't need animals. Once it's done, you exercise faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. You allow Jesus to construct faith in you. And that process of faith that's constructed, when it's complete, the manifestation come. Number two, part of the process of faith involves praise and worship that we have spoken to you before in our previous session. It usher in a new realm of praise and worship. So now for everything, you learn to give thanks. You learn to give thanks. You just praise and you worship. You praise and you worship. You praise and you worship. There is less of petitioning, but more of praise and worship. That's our advancement into the Melchizedek priesthood. To praise and worship, sometimes you didn't even ask. Everything is provided for. Because of the power of praise and worship in the Melchizedek generation that God has. Looking over into the Old Testament, we want to understand a certain concept. And for that, I'll bring you back all the way to Genesis chapter 22. When Abraham took his son Isaac to sacrifice. Now, all the blessings of Abraham have been similar to some say, extent from chapter 12, verse 1, uh, chapter 15, and, and onwards, all the blessings that through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And God will bless him, God will multiply his seed, God, and all these uh, blessings that are upon his life. When they came to the place where they successfully, both of them, I mean, took both their faith, to offer to God exactly what God asked, there's a slight difference in the blessing. Look at verse uh, 16. By myself I sown, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, multiply I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore. And up to this point, it's all the same. Basic blessings repeated. But the last line is a difference. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. It says there, your descendants, this is Isaac, Israel, uh, Israel onwards, all your descendants shall possess. You can put a shell as a wheel if you want to make it stronger. All your descendants will possess the gates of your enemies. Now here's a strange thing. Their descendants haven't been born yet. Up to this point, Isaac is not married yet. 
the descendants did not exist yet. But God right into their predestination book, victory has already been given. The enemy's gates is given to them to possess. Before even the battle is done, before the existence, God already give them the victory. Now this is a concept of Melchizedek priesthood sitting on the throne, already receive every blessing of God. Something has been already given. Similarity. It's impossible for us in the nature. How can people do not exist already have their destinies enshrined that they possess and conquer their enemies? All done. They haven't even existed. They haven't in, even, even uh, um, known what nations are. But it's already written, the enemies are under their feet. They're reconquered. So this, uh, what I call, future conquest given now in seed form. It's a powerful concept of the heavenly music because in heaven everything is done it's only on the earth is yet to be completed God from the seventh day already finished all his creation hiding some things in him but the world still continues and the world is still continuing on there's still six and seven years there's a millennium and there's uh, uh, all the other judgment all the things to come before new heaven and new earth but in heaven it is all done. Let me just illustrate uh, with another place so that you can identify with this concept of future victory assured now, receive an assured now in seed form. The ministry of Melchizedek, the priesthood. In, um, in here we look at um, this, uh, the book of Judges, yes. We look at the book of Judges, uh, Rue, Judges. And uh, Judges, towards the end of the book of Judges, you have a civil war. It's a terrible civil war. And um, the Benjamites refused to surrender the men who committed a crime. And so all of the children of Israel came out from Dan to Bathsheba to exercise the judgment against the abomination that took place. Whereas uh, the children of Benjamin are there. So let's read the background of this battle in history. Book of Judges chapter 20, verse 1 onwards. So all the children of Israel came out from Dan to Bathsheba as well as on the land of Gilead, and the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord at Mizpah. And the leaders of all the people, all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, a lot of them, 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. That's a lot of people, 400,000. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. So there's going to be a civil war. Then they inquire about, tell us, how did this wicked thing happen? So the Levite tell what happened and uh, about his and uh, all those things. And the territory it occurred in, of course, uh, is uh, Benjamite territory. And um, so the tribes of Israel in verse 12, Send men through all the tribe of Benjamin and say, What is this wickedness that you have done? Deliver the wicked man and then we'll be done to remove this evil. But the children of Benjamin, and actually because of this story, the Benjamite became the smallest tribe. Otherwise, they were quite big. The children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, children of Israel. And instead, they gathered to war. And they gathered from all their cities. And uh, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword. Because they were outnumbered, but they were all fighters. Uh, so, in verse 17, besides Benjamin, a man of, of Israel, number 400,000. Uh, and then they're going to go to war. Now, look what happened. 
In verse 18, the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. They said, which of us shall go out first to battle against the children of Benjamin? So they said, okay, who shall lead? You know, you can have a lot of soldiers, but you need proper management. Judah first. So Judah leads. And Judah went up and they fought and they lost. Verse 28, the children of Benjamin came out of Gibeah. On that day, cut down to the ground 22,000 men of Israel. Oh, what a sad day. Verse 23, the children of Israel went up, went before the Lord until evening, asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I again draw near for battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? So after they lost, 22,000 men died. They said, Should I still go, Lord? Do you still want me to go? And the Lord said in verse 23, Go up against him. And so there they go. The children of Israel approached the second day. They fought and uh, 18,000 people died. Oh, disaster. They lost two battle and they were more in number. 400,000 against 23,000. And they more in battle, they lost. Say it's not because you got a greater number that you necessarily win. It's the more skillful. Wow, what a disaster. So here in verse 26, all the children of Israel, that is, all the people went up and came to the house of God and they wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening. And they offered burnt offerings, peace offerings before the Lord. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Elias, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet, this is the third time, they lost twice, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? Or shall I see, shall I stop? The Lord says, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. Now, that is the difference. God gave them assurance of future victory. Being seated on a throne room is being given assurance of all victories for the future. And this time when they went out in the battle, they won. Now, this little story of the Civil War in the book of Judges tells us some things that are applicable in the Melchizedek priesthood. Since Jesus Christ has paid the price for everything and He ever lives, you don't need continual sacrifice. And all things are yea and amen in Christ. Everything has been given to us. Things of the spirit, things of the soul, things of the body. There's nothing that God has withheld. Think about it. At the cross of Calvary and in His resurrection, every single thing that we need, name and unnamed, known or unknown, has been given. Yes, Amen, in Jesus Christ. Been chopped. A blank check with the name sign Jesus Christ has been given to us. But there is a procedure how to tap upon that. And that procedure is through the ministry of the Melchizedek priesthood. What is the procedure? When you read this story that we have here, there were things that they did. Number one, they repented. Number two, they offer peace offerings and other sacrifices. Number three, they heard the voice of God that assures them and tell them this is done. Now these three points we translate into the New Testament. Every time as a Melchizedek priesthood comes before God, number one, 
since it does not depend on us or our strength or our ability or our intelligence or anything of our knowledge or, or strategy, nothing. Everything in life now depends on Jesus. Number one, knowing that without Jesus we can do nothing. Number one, the place to start is to humble ourselves before God. Remember how weaknesses are perfected? Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says, Three times he cried to the Lord, but in the end he understood when God says, My grace is sufficient for you. Yes, God's grace is sufficient for your life. The ministry is not a ministry of grace. God's grace is sufficient for your life. And he says, My strength is made perfect in weakness. Ah, it is when we humble ourselves and acknowledge our nothingness and all our inability and, and we are crucified with Christ, we recognize that it is God who is working through us, not ourselves. We need to humble ourselves. We humble ourselves and acknowledge that it is God. It is God and it is the grace of God. And it is by the mercy of God. Everything is now based on His mercy and not based on wages. Look at us coming before the throne of God. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And even in Hebrews chapter 4, when it tells us about this entering his rest, the rest is seated in heavenly places in Christ, that this entering of the rest, we will enter into the rest that God rested when he, uh, when he rested on the seventh day. When we enter into his rest, we cease from our works as in verse 10. And as we cease from our works, he tells us here in verse 15 and to 16, telling us about our weaknesses and how our dependence is on Him. He says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you see the word there? Mercy. The ministry of the priesthood of Marquis there is a ministry of mercy. It's a ministry of grace, it's a ministry of mercy. And in the ministry of grace and mercy, the first place is to humble ourselves in the sight of God. Just like in the end they learn how to humble themselves. And until we humble ourselves before God and acknowledge it's not us, miracles don't flow. Remember Peter in Acts chapter 3, after the healing of the lame man, all the people ran to him. And they look at him as if they are special. And then Peter says, it is not by our own power or godliness that this miracle happened. But it is the mercy of God. <laughs> it's the mercy of God. So the first place in this new dispensation is tapping up on the mercy of His grace. Humble ourselves. Number two, the offerings. For us, the offering is the fruit of our lips. Praise and worship. Praise and worship from a heavenly position. As we offer praise and worship, we give thanks before it takes place. Remember, it's not a process of faith. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And all you have is this. At the end of the faith process, all you have is an assurance that is done. A conviction that is done. An assurance that God has already declared it done. 
That is the substance of faith. So as you humble yourself, as you worship, you worship and worship and worship. If you have no assurance, you worship and worship and worship and pray and worship and pray and worship and pray. Whether it take one day, a few hours, several days or month, <coughs> you worship and pray until the assurance comes. Part of the faith process in the Melchizedek priesthood is learning that we are now ministers of grace. And grace is deposited measure upon measure. Faith is administered measure upon measure because both are the same. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. And faith is measured. You receive one measure, then another measure, and another measure. Perhaps you got faith to heal of simple sickness, but you don't have faith to heal of cancer. And as you pray and meditate, there is Jesus who can give this life. Jesus who enables you. Your faith may rise up and suddenly you got the assurance, yes! I'm healed. Yes, it's done. This is Melchizedek generation. Everything is from heaven. And what you need from heaven is the assurance and conviction of faith deposited into your heart. To receive that, we must be humble before in the sight of God. And number two, we must worship and pray and stay in the throne room until the assurance of faith comes. When the assurance of faith comes, you can still keep worshipping until, until you really, really, really convinced. The, in other words, you know that you know that you know that you know that you know it's done. See, the first time you know, you might have some doubts. Then you worship some more, you pray some more. And the faith keeps increasing. And the second time, you, your doubts are getting less. And you pray. Finally, you reach a place, and this is the better covenant, based on better promises. You reach a place of complete assurance of faith. You receive, what we call again, an assurance of future victory received now in the present time. The seed of it. Once you receive it, it changes. It changes. Then number three, they started going out to battle. Then number three, you begin to go out and walk the walk of faith. Begin to take over places just because of the assurance of faith in your life. This is how faith works. And the New Testament has got simpler I mean, there's still some complexities to understand things and, and, and faith. But it's got simpler. No need any more animal sacrifice since uh, the Lamb of God is ever live of. You don't need any religiosity and uh, all these uh, side things that makes um, uh, all the ceremony, the ordinances that Paul says, all this done away. Phew, phew, done away. All they need is faith and belief. And it's up to God. See, sometimes when you encounter some things, you're new to it, you're not sure whether this is God's will, you're not sure whether it's predestination, you're not sure whether there's a path to talk, you're not sure of the timing, you know what to do? Humble yourselves, repent if necessary, if you have things in your life that are hindering you, then you can pray also at that time if you want, pray out your heart, like Hannah pray out her heart. Then, number two, worship. Give thanks, worship. Give thanks, worship. Give thanks, worship. How long? Until it manifests. It might take a few hours, day, few days, few weeks, few months, few years, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter anymore. You know you have it inside. You had a conviction inside. You receive the answers 
to things in the future, even in the now, even when it hasn't manifest. You have received the assurance of future victory. And there's so many elements here. And you don't know the details how it work out. But you know that you know that you know that you know that you know it is done. That's the ministry of Malkisek, the priesthood. Better promises, better hope. And that's what it means for Jesus to sit on the throne at the right hand of God. Because at the throne, at the right hand of God, as God is seated on the throne, God has entered the rest. Everything has already taken place. The throne is only releasing and playing out all those things that God has already completed from the seventh day of creation. That God unveiled before us. That's how much the patience of God lasted. And it's there right now. <clears throat> Our same God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, has given to each one of you a heavenly perspective. He has taken all of us to the throne room. You are in heaven and not on earth. Now I know our consciousness and our natural man is here to carry out everything. But your spirit must ascend to the heavenly places and be there. Experience all the fullness of things in the heavenly places. Why? Because all transactions are now made up there, heavenly places. Says in the book of, and this is the predestination of all of us, even from the beginning, and from the foundation of the world. It says here, in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Do you see that? Every spiritual blessing. Everything has been done in Christ. If everything has been done, then what is there to do? It is for us to receive the portion of faith. It is for us to pray to receive the assurance of faith. Some things might start as a dream in your life. Some things might start as a desire. You're not ready for it until you check with Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Say, Lord Jesus, is this your will? If it's your will, can I right now pray for an impartation of a deposit of your faith because you are the author of that faith and you're the one who helped the faith to finish it. See, what is the author and finisher of faith doing? The author and finisher of faith is telling you that in the Melchizedek ministry, Right now, you write, you utter the beginning of faith and finish. Of course, you write based on what Jesus Christ tells you and what Jesus actually did. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. All and everything is complete. It makes life very easy. When you look at something and you say, okay, good design for it, right? all you have to do, pray to God. Now, sometimes God might show you this is not his will for you. Like he showed to the Apostle Paul that in his second missionary journey, when he tried to go to Mysia and then Bithynia, he says the Holy Spirit stopped him. Holy Spirit stopped him. And also the enemy also brought forth a group of Christians. They were spiritual enough to hear God, but not spiritual enough to go deeper than what they superficially hear. There is still God's will for Paul to go to Jerusalem, in spite of the danger. The New Testament works on the, de on the premise that God deposits His word into our life and we work out the work. If nothing comes, nothing can go out. If something comes, then something can go, can go for. Which is why it is important to daily receive from God and also some things that God has revealed to you, maybe the time has not yet come, you constantly bring it up before God in prayer, in humility, in prayer, in worship. Then let God show you by His own mercy and grace, what it can be like when it's time for you to receive it. Not all prayers or desires are necessary from God. But when you filter it by coming into the presence of God, to the Marquis that Priesthood, the heavenly dimension, 
you will receive a gift of assurance. And that assurance is powerful. It changes all things. The gift of assurance. Because Jesus is the one who authored and finished it. That gift of assurance can turn the tides of human uh, resistance against you. Because you have prayed through, you have uh, fasted through, and you can see every time you pray, you can feel it every time you pray, and it's churning on your inside. You can see what is the good things about God. You have prayed for the best of the best. You don't know how to pray. You still surrender yourself to God. God will definitely give you the best of the best of the best. That is a New Testament Marquisedec ministry. See all things from heaven. Let heaven fill your heart and your mind. Because there are some things that we ask for that might not be in God's will. But the things that are in God's will, your heart will warm, your heart will burn, and you will have an assurance deep inside, this is it. While to another person, they might not sense it. So the experience is true and real, but the methodology of us applying in each heart, constantly applying the rule and law of God in His grace, God in His mercy, can, can come and establish a new thing in Him. There is a new thing that God is showing in the world today. For Positive, a hundred percent. This priesthood is to know God and to teach others to know God. This priesthood is bringing you to perfection. Sometimes one is almost perfect, like the rich young man. Almost. But the Lord says, if you want to be perfect, Sell all, give to the poor and follow me. That will make you perfect. And you begin a new walk. The Marquisedec generation is to find this. To find your perfection. Yes, we will be, be perfect by the time Christ comes. Number three, partake of Christ. We need to be sustained every day. And it is something spiritual. But you know that you have it when you're eaten full spiritually. Jesus say, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. Nothing escapes Him. But the Father has allowed different, different things in order for us to acquire and learn. There is a new covenant, new dimension, and new level of praise and worship. Tap upon this. Lastly, a heavenly priesthood establishing better promises. So we are the heavenly priesthood, and we, through God's help, can establish an avenue of grace and blessings, which is the future answer today. There is growth in the harmony dimension. And I'm glad it's from the direction of heaven because if it's just on earth, people will do all kinds of carnal things with this truth. In fact, it's true. Heaven. And it follows heaven's direction, not earth's direction. It is the set our mind in heaven. Let's look at that verse for a moment in Colossians 3 verse 1. If you were raised with Christ, see that? Christ is up there. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, 
your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is life, appears, then you also will appear with Him. So it talks about seeking things. Now, if you notice, chapter 3, verse 1, is a continuation from chapter 2, verse 20, 21, 23, where it talked about dying to the principal, principal, principal things of the earth, and uh, holding on to do not touch, do not taste, do not handle all the do not, do not, do not. And it seems to be a false humility, self-imposed religion, neglect of the body, we shall no value against the indulgence of the flesh. And Paul said, don't do it that way. Here's the way to do it. Be heavenly minded. Set your mind on things above, and God will reveal to you how to do things on earth. You know, the higher you go, the clearer you see in God. And isn't life about seeing? If life were, if our life were a car, and you're driving the car, you might see the, you see the road in front of you, but if you could go right to the top, you not only see the road right in front of you, you see the end road, and you see the various possibilities of you taking different routes to reach that road. If you have eager vision, and eager vision establishes the fact that, all right, God says, all right, all right, all right, everything has been given. Now it's for you to catch the understanding of what portion is yours. Jesus, our conqueror, has cut to pieces all the enemy and now he's dividing the spoils and it's for you and I to say Father let it be unto me according to your word you can have desires and different things that you commit to God express to God and leave the rest to God if you were raised with Christ Colossians 3 verse 1 says Seek those things which are above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Because the things that are from heaven will produce things on earth. The things on earth cannot produce the things in heaven. For example, if you sought God and God gave you grace and favor, when, you, when you're on earth, the grace and favor works out, works for you, and you have an Obed-Edom effect. Obed-Edom was a person chosen by David whose house was along the way. When David tried to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the holy city or, uh, or his capital city of uh, Zion, uh, Jerusalem, the process at first uh, failed. Because it was not the way God wanted it. He wanted a priest to carry it. Then everyone was shocked. David was also upset. Everyone was angry. He said, okay, whose house is the nearest? Oh, over it down. You take, take, take that. In three months, because of spiritual forces, because you see, the spiritual make everything. Hebrews would want us to understand in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. That everything that is spiritual and physical is made from things not seen. So we can receive in the spirit. And Obed Edom prospered and uh, he, he, everything improved so outstandingly that David says, I want that too. I want the presence of God to be in my life. The ministry of the priesthood of Melchizedek administers the presence of God. And the greater the presence of God in your life, and it administers future assur uh, present assurance of future victory. He places it into you. Once he's put it into you, it just magnetizes and becomes an obey effect. It draws things to you. And it repels things that are not supposed to come to you of evil. It's a powerful force. Heaven is more powerful than we realize. Being heavenly minded is more powerful than we realize. Being heavenly hearted is more powerful than we realize. 
learning to ask for things that are above and not things below is a powerful method of prayer where you understand which one is the true reality. We may be physical beings, but this physical is a temporal reality. The true reality is a spiritual dimension of which there are laws and functions in it. Receive and understand that as a high priest of Melchizedek, in the Melchizedek order, you had the power to ordain, to change things in within your jurisdiction. Don't go, in, go, don't go beyond your jurisdiction. Within your jurisdiction, you can release things spiritually that will create something physically in time. Like for example, who knows? You go and pray for a certain area, you're in charge of a district, you pray. And you pray and you pray and ask God, bless this place. Suddenly, little stores come, businesses start to come into the area, the whole area develop because of your blessing. In Melchizedek, is the power of the blessing. When you bless, it is blessed. And that's the power God gives to you. To bless, and one would receive future assurance now. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you all the seven spirits of, of God, of peace, of love, of joy, of glory, of life, of wisdom, of mercy, and establish you in a perfect will of God. Amen. In Jesus' name.